turning to the book of James, James chapter 1, give you a little bit of a more detailed update on Brother Brock. Um, it's been interesting. This has been an interesting week for me. Um, Monday, for those of you here Wednesday, you heard the story that Monday I received a call uh, from a family looking for a pastor to do a funeral. Um, <clears throat> they were looking for a Baptist pastor. The, uh, the family member that had passed away had no other relatives here. Their, his only nephew and his wife and family lived in Wyoming, and they had come in for the, the service. And, and um, so I went and, and did that service. When this was an individual that, honestly, we knew nothing about, talking to the family, uh, grandparents had gone to, um, had gone to um, Warren Woods Baptist Church many, many years ago, and uh, the fellow had passed away. He had gone there when he was young, but they couldn't tell me anything about him ever reading his Bible. And you do a service like that, and there's really not a whole lot you can say other than, uh, you know, I went to, uh, God was really good to me. He gave me uh, some scripture there in, in uh, John 11, where when Jesus came to, to Mary and Martha, how he comforted the family. And that's really all you could do is comfort and, and talk about the promise of eternal life he promised there. And then I contrast that with where we are with Brother Brock. Um, I've been to see him almost every day this week. It was early this morning. And uh, he's ready to go to heaven. I mean, you, during the week, you've talked to him, and I mean, he knows he's saved. He'll tell you um, exactly when he got saved. And he talks about, you know, when he was in Korea, God saved his life, and then he came home, and then God saved his soul. And uh, you hear his testimony, and he's just rejoicing. And they said this morning when I got there, um, and they really were expecting him to pass this morning, uh, early in the night, uh, he got up about 1 o'clock, and from 1 to 6, he was talking to everybody. And uh, they read the scriptures together and started singing some songs, and he was trying to sing with them, and he was raising his hands, praising the Lord. And uh, what a difference when you know the Lord, and then your family knows the Lord, and they know you know the Lord. What a difference. And uh, just, uh, I walked in, they said, uh, you know, his brother told me, like, we've had church this morning. And uh, that's about the third time I've heard that this week. You know, and then they've done a lot of Bible reading and prayer. And, and uh, it ought to be that way. Amen. Amen. And uh, so please be praying for the family. Um, they're, they're, act they're doing well um, because they, they're at peace. They know what's going on. And, uh, but do pray for Marie. She's really tired. And with her breathing issues, it's, it's not been easy for her this week. So be praying for her especially and appreciate that. All right. Um, the first thing we need to do is review our memory verse. Who knows the verse? Our memory verse can stand and say it for us. I do have my candy. Oh, yeah. There are a few York peppermint patties. Let me stick those in my pocket. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Might need one of those to mail the message. And uh, so uh, I heard a couple people tell me they knew them. Becky, right? Mm -hmm. Don't look at the book. No cheating. This is not an open book test. I think I get, I get to take a bite out of her candy if she gets it right. <laughs> we'll go to Jean. Jean, you ready, right? Are you ready? Yeah. Go ahead. Great job. All right. There's all kinds of goodies that's in there. A verse, that's our memory verse in... Are you? That's right. And that's not cheating. That's just utilizing your resources. Too many choices. There you go. York. All right. Who else? Brother, Brother Shaw, I saw your hand next. Okay, they get two because they both did it. All right. And, and duet, y'all singing a duet this morning? We were trying to save you time. There's all kinds of good stuff in there. I can see the pro. Yeah. There, there are no more Milky Ways because I ate them all yesterday. Sorry, but that's what happens. Becky, you ready now? Awesome. Yorks are the fastest thing that go in my office. I have another bag and they're hidden. So, <laughs> who else? Who else is ready? She can. No, you can't do it again. Man, just like our kids. Yes, sir, go ahead. Bring it 
before the Christmas season, uh, he's going out with it, and I said that he'd be so close. It's really, really, really close. <laughs> What's the reference? Uh, I saw that cheating over there. Should we let him have one? Yeah. I mean, it's really close. Yeah. Just like three words. Yeah. No, I don't know about that. I just think maybe, okay. Come on, I'm, I'm new to this, all right? I'm right? Who else? Now, come on, I know some of the rest of you know it. Come on. Can I do No, you can't do it again. Good night. Brother Samuel, did you raise your hand? I see you. I'll be there. Did I see your hand? Okay. I saw your hand. It's like you heard about the evangelist that was flying into to, uh, to, to the airport there in New York City in LaGuardia. He was flying across the harbor and he looks out the window and he sees the Statue of Liberty there with the torch raised high. The evangelist looks out the window and says, I see that hand. That's just what evangelists do. Right. You ready? You're cheating again. No, because you talk so long. <laughs> it's going to get worse. One word was missed. Anybody know which one it was? Which it should be that. But we'll still get it. I'll just take a bite. Okay. All right. I am going to have to grab one of those Yorks, put in my pocket. Who else? Now, if I don't forget that, it might melt. No, it won't last that long. Who else? Anybody over here? I'll give you a chance. All right. The animal crackers are good. Ray came and grabbed some of those out of my office this morning. He saw those and, yeah. Genevieve was hilarious. This morning I walked over, y'all were having breakfast, and I had one of my caramel fraps in my hand. She saw me, then she looked at my frap. And me? She went, eh. No, I didn't give her any. She was trying. And then I leaned down, and she's pulling my coat, trying to get to it. Yeah. Anybody else? All right. That's your last chance. Until next week. Another memory verse. All right. Uh, for this one, let's see. Let me get to the memory verse for this lesson. It is, where are we at? Joshua 1.8. Mm -hmm. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then shalt thou make the way prosperous, and then shalt thou have good success. Wonderful, wonderful verse, one we quote often, and uh, so those are good verses. And uh, do what you'd be working on those verses. When um, I like the verses that they're putting on the lessons because the memory verse really captures the whole theme of that lesson, and that's why they choose those, and so it's important for us to, to look at those. Let's go to James chapter 1, and we'll begin reading this morning in verse number 19. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Have some friends in the South say that's why they speak the way they do. Yankees talk too fast. They said you're supposed to be slow to speak. <laughs> Never worked for me, but anyway. Uh, for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. But be you doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. We'll be looking at this morning, lesson number two, rooted in Christ's word. Let's go ahead and pray, and we'll get into the, the thoughts of the lesson this morning. Father, I pray you'd help us as we look at this portion of Scripture and see some application that I believe will be a help to us. So I pray you'd instruct us. And uh, for many of these things, we've, we've heard them before, but... May you remind us, may you cause us to, to do some self-inventory, to, to see where we are in these matters. And I pray you'd help us to be rooted in the Word of God. I pray you'd help the other classes as the teachers are teaching all over the building this morning. I pray you'd speak to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
You know, it's amazing in the scriptures, uh, the Bible is called the Word of God. And in, we know in, in John chapter 1, Jesus is called the Word of God. They're both the Word of God. They're both the living Word. Amen. I remember John O'Reilly saying one time, Jesus and the Bible are twins. So they're exactly alike. And uh, uh, he's the only person I've ever heard say that. But, but, uh, but I think it's a great thought that uh, when we look at, at the Bible, we're seeing the personality of the Lord Jesus. And, uh, you know, when we look at, you know, as believers, as we go on in our Christian life, we have a tendency to, to, to observe other people. And by the way, you, you, you do that whether you try to or not. We've all seen people that their lives are a mess. Uh, the last couple of years, there have been a couple of NFL players that they're just a train wreck. And uh, I'm thinking about one, he was drafted. And uh, in college, he was a train wreck. And then he, make, he signs a contract for millions of dollars and the train goes off the cliff. And, 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 and as a society, we try to think, well, it's, you know, it's, it's just you know, all the opportunities in front of me. He didn't know how to handle it. No, there's something inside. There's a, uh, a problem that is below the surface that leads to that. You know, when we go through, uh, through life and we see people with, with, with problems, we look at our own life, we see things that are happening that are not what they ought to be. We've got to realize that uh, while we observe the fruit, the problem is not the fruit, the problem is the root. But it always reveals itself in the fruit. Uh, you know, for a while you can put on the front and you can hide uh, what's on the inside, but it will eventually come out. Uh, I remember the house used to say, everyone rises or falls to their own character level. And I believe that's true. Uh, that's why a lot of folks, we, we, we may win them to Christ, and, and I believe they do genuinely get saved, but they've had a life of zero character, and it's so much more difficult for them to, to grow in the Lord because there's just no discipline in their life. It's not to say they can't, because God can do that. He can transform anyone, amen? Uh, but, uh, but those that, have, that already have the, the, the habits of getting up, well, it's a little bit easier to read your Bible if you get up early in the morning, if you already do that. Uh, if you already have some character traits of taking care of things, uh, then that can translate to your spiritual life. But oftentimes in our lives, there are things going on in the, the underneath that we don't see, and that's why the roots are so important. Um, in a biblical example, that would be Cain and Abel. Uh, here you have two brothers that I believe were, were probably twins, uh, if you go back to the Scriptures. Uh, and and uh, because it says that uh, Adam knew his wife and she bare Cain and she bare again Abel. It doesn't say he knew his wife again. I believe they were twins. They came to the point of age of giving sacrifices at the same age. And uh, I wouldn't argue with over it. I, I mean, I wouldn't I don't hold that as a doctrine. It just as I look at the scriptures, it looks like they were the same age. They were raised in the same home, same parents, only parents that were ever perfect. Think about that one. Now, they weren't perfect when they had their children because the children came after they left the Garden of Eden, but they were the only parents that had ever been perfect, only, only parents that ever lived in the Garden of Eden, uh, both raised in the same home, same mom, same dad, and one wanted to serve God and obey God. The other was a murderer. I mean, killed his brother. And we won't look at it for the sake of time this morning. But, but when Cain killed Abel, uh, the reason he did that was because of what was in, uh, inside, the roots. Uh, he was filled with jealousy and anger. Uh, and, the, you know, it, and that led to the murder on the outside. And uh, you know, no doubt uh, when before that event, when Adam and Eve looked at them, I don't think they expected Cain to be a murderer. But it was something that was on the inside. And so as we, as we look at, at, at our lives and, and try to figure out how do I keep my life from getting out of control? How do I keep myself right with God? Well, it starts with, as we talked about in the first lesson, being firmly planted in Christ. We've got to be saved. Isn't it amazing? We, we expect lost people to act like saved people. Don't be surprised what people that aren't saved will do, what they will say and how they will act. They just act like lost people. The way we did before we got saved. Sometimes as believers, I think we forget that. You know, we, we forget what it was like to be lost and how everything changed when we came to know the Lord. 
But if we're, we're rooted in Christ, we've been saved, and we are going to grow in Him and, and bear fruit that, that would be pleasing to the Lord, then our, we must be, must be planted in Christ Jesus. And in John chapter 1, uh, and go ahead and turn there if you would, John chapter 1, uh, just an amazing, amazing chapter. I think I mentioned in a, in a, a message recently, I might have been in Sunday school last week, verse number 1, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. I like God's statement there. He didn't give any explanation. When all started, in the beginning was the Word. He was with God, and He is God. Uh, man, what a great start. The same as in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. He's talked about the Word. Look at verse number 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So here we see Jesus is being referred to as the Word. Uh, there's no way for us to have a <clears throat> abiding, lasting, fruitful relationship as a believer with Christ unless we're firmly planted in the Word of God. You can't separate Christ from His Word. In fact, everything God's ever done, He's done by His Word. When we get to heaven, we'll be judged by this book. And so uh, that's got to be our foundation. It's probably in your notes there, Psalm 119, uh, 140. Thy word is very pure, therefore thy servant loveth it. Uh, Jesus, even in John 8, 31 and 32, then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are you my, my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. We often quote verse two, uh, 32, but we miss verse 31, and that's the key to verse 32. Notice what he said, then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him. So when he's speaking here, he's talking to Jews that are saved. They had heard enough of the gospel, they had heard him, and they had trusted Christ. And they were following him. There were a lot of people that followed Jesus and were listening as he taught. You'd like to have been there. I mean, I read some of these stories and some of the things he taught, I'd love to have been in the crowd. And these were Jews that listened to him, they heard him. You and I would have looked at them and called them disciples. Now, normally we think of disciples, we think of the 12, but there were many others that were called disciples. They were followers. They were students. They were people that were following the Lord. And, and so Jesus is referring to these Jewish believers that were following him, and he says there, if you continue in my, what's the word? Word. Then are ye my disciples, it doesn't end there, indeed. What's he saying? There's, there's a couple of different kinds of disciples. There's a disciple that's a follower. They believe. They're, they're learning. Then there's the disciple indeed. These are the committed ones. These are the ones, notice what it says, who continue in my word. See, not all of the disciples, not all the people that got saved that followed Jesus kept following him. Some of them turned away when the preaching got too tough for them. Remember that? We talked about that recently in a message where, where so many left. Jesus turned to the disciples and said, will ye also go away? You see, uh, what the, the answer is if you continue in my word. Uh, and and it's, it's the thought of, uh, it's not something, well, you heard it once, so I know that. It's continuing. Staying at it. Continuing in my word. It's talking about obedience. Then are you my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Notice, let's read it again. Then said Jesus to those disciples which believed on him, if you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Uh, let me just throw this thought to you. As you read those two verses together, we love to quote verse 32, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. But verse 31 is teaching us, <clears throat> it's not just knowing the truth, hearing it, it's, oh yeah, I believe that, it's you continue in that. There are a lot of believers that have heard a lot of the Word of God that aren't free day by day. There's a lot of stuff binding them up. They have sin tying them up. Why? They're not continuing. They're not staying with what they've been taught, continuing. They're not growing. If you and I are going to be the kind of believer that is free to do the will of God and obey Him and be consistent, we're going to have to stay in the book consistently. Um, let me give you a statement. You will recognize genuine disciples of Jesus Christ by their response to the Bible. 
what's your response to the Word of God? Well, oh, it's the Bible. I carry it. Yeah, it's the Word of God. I believe it. Yeah, but what about when you're confronted with it? How do you respond? Um, you see, there, there are a couple of ways we can respond. Some people, when they're confronted with the Scriptures, um, they humbly repent of what the Scriptures showed them where they were wrong, and they submit to what it says. Others get angry. They get mad. And, and, and they, they, they refuse to submit. What's your attitude towards the Word of God? You see, it's either you continue in His Word in His way or you continue in your way. And by the way, it's a choice that we all make. Uh, I love what it says there. I think the Scriptures are in there. Psalm, 1, or Psalm 19, 7 and 8. Are those in your book? The law of the Lord is perfect. Moses says, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes are, are, of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eye. Notice it gives an attribute about the Word of God and then what it will do to you. You can't hang around this book. I mean being in it consistently and it not change you. It's going to. It's perfect, it's sure, it's right, it's pure. If you choose to continue in it, to be rooted and to be grounded in it, it's going to produce fruit that's different than what the world produces. You can't help it. And so this morning we're going to get into uh, the first thought here. Uh, go back to our text there in, in James, James 1. And we'll look at um, verse number 19 again. And John, while you're back there, we'll take the batteries out of that clock. Would you? It's, just, it's moving too fast. Can we, have a, can we have a time change right now? Just set it back an hour. And we, will that work? Okay, well, I was, it was worth trying. Okay, look at verse 19. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. We're going to look at that first thought there, swift to hear. If, you're, if you've got your, your books there, Roman number one, prepared to receive. Prepared to receive. Uh, we must purposely get our hearts ready to receive the Word of God. We'll look at some scripture that in a minute. Uh, it says here that we need to be swift to hear. If you've got letter A there, I'm going to use the word as it's written in there, and I probably won't use it again that way because it's not how I normally frame that sentence. We need a spirit of receptivity. That's not a word until I studied this lesson, Brother Mark, that I have used in a sentence any time recently. Anybody else like that? Like, okay, that's a good word. I understand what it says, but it just doesn't flow off the tip of my tongue. Can I get a witness on that one? Receptivity. What does that mean? You receive it. You're teachable. That's what it means. Uh, you, we need the spirit of receptivity that we're ready to hear, swift to hear. Um, when we walk into church, we walk into Sunday school, we walk into a church service, we need to have the attitude as, I'm here to receive from God. And we're not talking about money. We're not talking about gifts. We're talking about the truth from the Word of God that is life-changing. We come into the auditorium. We ought to come with that attitude, with that spirit. I'm here to receive from God. Uh, the announcements, they're helpful. Nobody listens to them, but they're helpful. Sometimes I want to come in and just... Just act like I'm the teacher from Charlie Brown. Wah, 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 wah. And I don't think it would make any difference in that part of the service. But what else would Brother Shaw have to do with that part of the service? You know, you got to get him up out of his chair, wake him up. And he'd talk about, uh, you know, the family fun night next week. By the way, we, we did add something. I don't think it's in the bulletin. Uh, if you've got the little remote controlled stuff, remote control cars, like I, I've, got, um, I've got the little um, um, mater that I'm bringing. It's about that big, remote controlled. Right, loves chasing that thing. He loves chasing the dog with that thing. And uh, he'll be here. Uh, Brother Layton, you're bringing some of your stuff, right? Your uh, Ollie's coming, right? And uh, some of the ramps. And, and we got some other stuff like that will be coming. We'll have a, an area roped off, not to protect the children, but to protect the, our toys. Yeah. Amen, Brother John? Some of that stuff's expensive. <laughs> Every time I try to drive one of those, the kids walk up and grab it. And, you know, like, put it down. But anyway. We hear the announcements. You thought I was off track. No, I knew exactly where I was. And uh, we, we hear that. The music. Don't you love the music at church? Man, what was the name of that song, Brother Bernie, you were playing during the off Troy just now? I was trying to think of the words. 
Yes, thank you. My hope is in the Lord. What a beautiful song. I enjoyed that. And uh, I'm trying to, I was trying to remember the words because I've heard it several times, but it's been a while. And uh, we come and, and the music ought to speak to you. I mean, we, we ask everybody who sings to pray over what they're going to sing. And they've worked on it. And, and, uh, it's, it's, and by the way, they're not singing it for you. They're not playing it for you. They're playing it for the Lord. We just get to listen in on it. Hallelujah. And it helps us. And the fellowship is, is encouraging. I love coming to church. Right, that's when I get to see y'all. Rest of the week, I don't get to see most of you. Unless I drop by where you work. And I've done that with a few of you. And uh, bosses usually don't like that when I do it. But uh, I don't get to see y'all very often. So where do we gather for fellowship? We do it here. That's a wonderful thing. It's like a family reunion, every service. I like it. And uh, that's why I don't, I don't like to leave. And it's why I preach forever. No, I'm just kidding. No, I'm not. But anyway, we, um, uh, we enjoy that part of the service. But you understand, that's not the main reason we're here. The Bible is why we're here. We come here to learn the Word of God, to be taught, to be instructed, so we can go out there and make a difference. Uh, we read the Scripture in, in one of the, the, the services this week, and I, they all kind of blend together, and I can't remember what I said, what service. So, but I know we talked about when Jesus... Uh, he, that uh, as his custom was, went into the synagogue and took the, the, the scroll from the, 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 uh, the leader there and, and he read in Isaiah 61 and handed the scroll back and then he taught. Um, you know, that's, that's why we come to church. You imagine being in a church service where Jesus reads scriptures about himself and then he expounded on it. Those guys on the road to Emmaus. I mean, he begins at Moses and the prophets. He begins to tell them everything in the Bible about him. I just wonder how long it took to walk to hear all that. Have you ever thought about that? Because there's an awful lot in there about him, amen? But that's why we come. We come to church. You come with the attitude like, I want to hear the Bible. That's why I'm not, I'm not in a hurry to get out. You've noticed that, haven't you? Because why I want to hear more of the Word of God. Uh, when we had our Bible conference, there were no short messages in that meeting. I wasn't disappointed at all. Why? We were being given a feast from the Scriptures. I was talking about the Shaw about that the other day. We're still chewing on some of those messages, and I'm going back and listening to them. And, and uh, that Tuesday night message of, uh, uh, of Brother Torres, I think I've listened to that multiple times now. Like, man, there's some good stuff there. There's, there's some ribeyes laying there that you need to chew on a bit. Amen. When we come to the scripture, come to church, we ought to come with that attitude, swift to hear, be ready to hear. But what about when you're at home and you're doing your personal Bible reading? I was talking to somebody here at the church within the last week or so, and they talked about they were having trouble in their, their Bible reading because they couldn't get past certain scriptures. They were just so good, and they got to thinking about what that verse, you ever been there? I keep a notebook next to, to me. I have one of those... Um, I use a legal pad next to my Bible when I'm, when I'm reading, and I just start making notes. And sometimes, Brother Shaw, I don't get real far. You know, I mean, I have a goal of how many chapters to read, but sometimes I don't get but maybe four or five verses, and God's talking so loud, I don't want to miss what He's saying, so I slow down. I love what Tom Alone said one time. Somebody asked him, how much Bible do you read? He said, I read until God speaks to me. And I believe you ought to try to read your Bible through all the way through in the year. And I believe you ought to work at that. But I'd much rather, as you're reading, you're listening for his voice. And when he's speaking to you directly, slow down and let him talk. Amen. Sometimes that means you've got to go back and read those verses again. When you sit down to read your Bible, is it just so you can get the check mark on the, you know, the Bible reading chart? Because at the end of January, we're going to have the Bible readers dinner. And you want to be there because you want to eat whatever we're going to have. And it'll be good. Or is it because, like, God, I came here to hear from you. I want you to speak to me. That's the idea of being swift to hear. And notice he says there uh, in, in our scripture, look at it again, verse 19, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak. Um, Jesus often said, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Uh, that term is used, or something very similar, that's used eight times in the Gospels, uh, or in the New Testament, excuse me. Um, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. I think Jesus was, was showing us we have a human tendency to, I'll use the term, mentally channel surf. You ever done it where you sit down, you want to watch something on TV, you don't know what's on. 
So you just hit in the clicker. You might call it a remote. We call it a clicker. Or Ray calls it the moat. The moat. And you're punching the bunch and you're trying to, and you're watching and see what's on there. So you watch maybe, you know, four seconds. Oh, I don't want that. And you click the next one. I wonder how many of us do that when we come to the Bible, whether it's in church or our personal Bible reading time, because we're thinking about something else. And we're, we're not really focused. Uh, I forget where I was going yesterday. I was driving somewhere yesterday and totally missed my turn. I was headed to, to, to a place where I go normally. I think it was coming here to the church. And uh, I was, uh, yeah, it was. I was going to get gas yesterday morning. I still need to get gas. And it's down to that point. It's almost ready to have that red light coming at me, fuel low. That E does not mean enough. And I had planned to stop at the BP by my house. It's on my way to get on the highway. But I had something else on my mind, Brother Shaw. And when I was pulling on to 696, I'm looking at my gas gauge like, I hope I got enough. And I still haven't gotten gas. So I've got to do that when I leave today. Or I'll be calling somebody. Brother Hundley, you got a gas can. <laughs> Y'all knew that when Brother Gip was here, I ran out of gas with him and his wife in my car. I did. I was coming back from Andrea's garden all day long. I say, oh, I got to get gas. I got to get gas. And I'm talking to him. We're, we get done eating. We're driving here to the church. <laughs> right in front of the college. He said, what happened? I said, you don't want to know. I have no gas can in my car. And I had to call Rhonda and Sarah to come rescue us. You talk about being embarrassed. In the last year, I've been embarrassed twice with preachers. That one, and I'm going to tell them myself now, when Brother uh, Jenkins was here, after the service, we're doing everything, and he's back here at this table, and, and uh, Brother Allen gave me the love offering check for him, I, and he had a bunch of people around him at the table. I stuck it in my coat pocket, and uh, I watched him give him a check for the stuff we bought for the music ministry, all the you know sheet music, and and uh, we get to the restaurant. I took my coat off, laid it down. I got home, took off my coat, and there is his check. Like, oh, I have never done that in all my years of ministry. I've had it done to me a couple times, and some I don't think it was on purpose, but, or it was by accident. But, and so I said, well, I'll give it to him in the morning. Well, he left early in the morning. I said, well, it's okay. I'll just mail it to him. I called him and apologized. He was laughing. He said, I didn't even think anything about it. And uh, I said, I didn't either, apparently. <laughs> then I lost the envelope. I still don't know where it's at. We had to write a new check and mail it to him. Like, I am so embarrassed. Remember those two brain cells I was telling you about? They don't talk to each other at all anymore. Amen. <laughs> what happened? I got sidetracked. Squirrel! But anyway. <laughs> say, Pastor, that's hilarious. Yeah, but are we like that in our Bible reading? Do we come to the scriptures, whether it's in a Sunday school class, a preaching service, whether it's our you on Friday, or whether it's our personal devotions, are we coming, we're doing that while we're doing 10 other things? It says, let our men be swift to hear, slow to speak. I think the Bible's trying to give us the proportion there, the attitude that we ought to come being receptive. We must choose to listen. An Old Testament example of that, you're all very familiar with 1 Samuel chapter 3. Remember that? When, when in the middle of the night, little Samuel's there at the temple with, with uh, Eli. And, and in the middle of the night, little Samuel, little boy, he hears, um, Samuel, Samuel. He wakes up. So it's got to be Eli. He wasn't saved yet. And uh, so he, he runs to Eli. He wakes up Eli. He says, what do you want? You imagine that. I mean, you're there, you're, you're sleeping, and somebody comes wake up. What do you want? Why did you wake me up? Well, you called me. No, I didn't. And there's a little discussion. He goes back, lays down, and uh, a little while later, Samuel, Samuel. It's like, it's got to be Eli. He gets up. He goes to Eli and shakes him. You know, he's hearing voices. And uh, he wakes up Eli. And, and after a third time, Eli said, it's got to be the Lord. It is interesting. It took Eli three times to figure out it was the Lord talking. And, of course, Samuel didn't know the Lord yet. So he tells him, he said, if you hear it again, he said, it's got to be the Lord. So, you know, tell the Lord, speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. Sure enough, he goes and lays back down and God speaks to him again. Samuel, Samuel, he says, speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. In 1 Samuel chapter 3, you see, Samuel got to the point in his life where he was listening for God's voice. I mentioned by that third time, he had a hard time going back to sleep with the shawl. It's like, is he going to talk again? Is that really the Lord? 
There's no doubt. You know, Samuel was, was being raised in the temple. He knew God spoke to Eli. But this was new. God was speaking to him. Remember the first time you were reading your scriptures and God spoke to you? Remember that? When you're reading along and all of a sudden you see something you've never seen before? That the Holy Spirit just revealed something to you? There's nothing like it. I, I, there have been times I've been studying a scripture and man, something just jumps off the page and you're wondering, when did God put that in the Bible? You ever been there? And you're like, man, that is awesome. And, and you're reading it and, and you're so excited you want to wake everybody up and tell them. But it's you know, late at night, early in the morning. And somehow just when, when we wake up our wives in those situations, hey, let me show you this in the Bible. They're like, what do you want? <laughs> kind of like Eli was. Why? Because God's speaking to us. It's personal. Why did that happen? We were swift to hear. There was a spirit of, uh, of receptivity. There, I used it again. Probably won't do it again. The story's told about uh, a guy that's a naturalist, a guy who studies, studies the creation. Uh, and his friend were walking through uh, Central Park in, uh, in New York City, or one of the big cities, one of the big parks. And they're walking along. And if you've ever walked in a place like that, it's beautiful. And San Diego has a place like that. It's called Balboa Park. And it's absolutely gorgeous. And there's little walking trails we go through. And these guys are walking along, and, and all of a sudden the guy said, Wait, did you hear that? Did you hear what? Did you hear those crickets? He said, With all the noise, with all the cars going, how did you hear the crickets? He said, Well, I listened for them. And uh, he said, well, I, I didn't hear those. A little while later, they're walking along, and, and the, the guy took some change out of his pocket and threw it on the walkway. As soon as those coins hit the walkway, everybody in the park turned. Why? Because we've conditioned our ear to listen for money hitting the ground. And there's a special sound it makes. Amen? We hear what we want to hear and what we condition ourselves to hear. Uh, we train our ears. Um, a press operator running a press, they can listen to that press running and they know what's going on in that press. They know every turn of that machine. They, they, they can hear the cylinders coming together. They hear the paper being picked up and shoved through the press. They know what it's supposed to sound like when it goes through the impression cylinder and the plate cylinder. They hear that and they know, okay, it's running right. They don't even have to look at it. Why? Because they've conditioned themselves. My dad had a mechanic that, uh, Brother Mark, before he would ever look at anything on a car, he would just walk up to it so have you turn on? He'd close his eyes and lean up against the car and put his hand on the fender. And he'd just stand there for a few minutes. And then he'd say, okay, we're going to look at this, this, and this. Brother John knows what he's talking about. He hears some things that he's, been, he's trained his ear to hear. You know, vacuum leaks. Those will drive you nuts. Remember on my 67 GTO, I had the um, uh, um, quadrajet on that thing. And those things will drive you crazy. Anybody ever rebuild a quadrajet? What was that, Brother John? Quadrajunk, quadra yeah. A lot of guys pull those off and put a holly back on top of there. But uh, there, there's little sounds they make. There's nothing like the sound of those back two barrels opening up. Well, exactly right. And you watch your gas gauge go like that. While the speedometer goes the other way. It's an awesome sound. It's expensive, but... But you train yourself to that. Have you conditioned yourself to hear the Word of God? Children have selective hearing loss. I've been talking about it many times. You tell, I'm, you can look, I'm you grab them by the face and look at them. Clean your room. You come back from work, it's still a disaster. I mean, it looks like a bomb went off in there. Can I get a witness? Son, don't you remember I told you to clean your room? You did? Parents, can I get a witness? Oh, yeah. Why? Because they just tune us out. But we'd be three rooms over talking about going to Chuck E. Cheese. Or as, as, as uh, Haley calls it, Chuck E. Cheese. I'm just not sure how to take that statement. But <laughs> that's what she calls Does she still call that? She's called that for years, Chuck E. Cheese. She may be calling it the right thing now. But, but they hear that. They come running or ice cream. We, we, we condition ourselves. Here the Bible says we are to be swift to hear. We ought to so train ourselves to listen to the Scriptures. 
The scripture goes on to look at James 1.19 again. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak. Um, the thought here is the, the, the admonition to be slow to speak comes after the admonition of being swift to hear. We've got to hear God speak and we have something eternal life changing going on in our life, then we're able to speak. Remember what Brother um, Torres taught us on Monday and Tuesday night of the meeting? That before we can know how to pray, before we know how to talk to God, we've got to learn how to listen and let Him talk to us so we know what to say back to Him. If you weren't here for those messages, you, you ought to get them. Uh, the Bible tells us in Proverbs 17, 28, Even a fool, when he holdeth his peace, is counted wise. And he that shutteth his lips is esteemed a man of understanding. When we speak without first hearing from God, that's usually when we make mistakes. We're often, if we're speaking before we've heard from God, we're just giving our opinion. And as the old southern preacher said, opinions are like armpits. Most people have a couple, and most of them stay. Opinion doesn't matter. What matters, what does God say? So we've got to learn to slow down. Um, if you have an opportunity to stand somewhere and teach, uh, those of you that teach Sunday school, work in, in master clubs or in children's church, uh, as teachers and preachers, we've got to be especially careful to be swift to hear. I'll close with this thought. Well, in James 1, 3 there, or James 3, 1, excuse me, my brother, not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater damnation. We're held to a higher standard. I love this story, and I'll, and I'll close with this thought, this story. Brother Hiles, one day, he went to visit one of his long-term deacons at First Baptist in Hammond. He was at the hospital, and they knew it was just going to be a day or two before the fellow went to heaven. The man looked at Brother Hiles, he said, Brother Hiles, I want to thank you for something. He said, what's that? He said, I want to thank you for walking with God all week long. And then on Sunday, you told us what he said. That's the way it's supposed to be. As a parent, I'm supposed to walk with God. Get his instructions. Why? So I can then speak to my children what I heard from him. You want a parenting book? You've got it in your hands. It's your Bible. That's the parenting manual. Uh, if you want to be a leader in a business and lead your employees, listen to God and then speak to them what he said to you. We ought to be praying for leaders for our country that listen to God and then lead the country according to what He said. That's, that's why when the, a new king came in Israel, they made a copy of the Bible and gave it to him. It was to be with him and he was to read it. Well, if it's good enough for kings, it's good enough for us. Amen. Swift to hear. We'll stop right there. Father, thank you for the instruction of the Scriptures. May you help us to be swift to hear. May we listen to you. I pray you would just continue to work in our hearts. and I pray you'd help us in whatever area of leadership we have, whether it's that of a, a teacher, a pastor, or whether it's that of a parent, a grandparent, Sunday school teacher, whatever area of life you've given us responsibility in, may we use that opportunity to walk closer to you so we can instruct those under our care in what you said. And we'll thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.